I couldn't sleep. I could still see the the green hat of the of the Grinz troop of uh, Data Air. I can still see the cuff that says Grinz troop and Data Air. I can still the the Stasi interrogator. I can still see him talking to me, and and I can see you know the I I just it comes back from time to time. It comes back. Welcome to Cold War Conversations. <laughs> Massive Soviet military forces have invaded the small, non-aligned, sovereign nation of Afghanistan. Poland's military leader, General Jaruzelski, urged the Polish people tonight not to demonstrate on Tuesday, the second anniversary of the founding of the banned trade union, Solidarity. And I'm here to host this final program from the German Democratic Republic for you. Todd Anton was arrested by the Stasi while on a day trip to East Berlin in the 1980s. He gives a raw and powerful account of his arrest, interrogation and eventual release. If you'd like to support the podcast, then from the price of a cup of coffee a month, you can help us cover our increasing costs and keep us on the air, as well as receive a Cold War Conversations coaster, this year's sought-after household accessory. Just go to patreon.com slash cold war pod that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash cold war pod thank you so much to our current and latest patrons please do leave reviews on itunes it really helps us get new guests on the show and raises our profile so on to today's episode where we welcome todd anton to our cold war conversation well, the origin started with my with my father who fought in World War II in Europe, and uh, I wanted to see his war experiences, and I wanted to see many of the places where he fought. And when I uh, had the opportunity to go to to Germany in 1987, um, I went on a world or a German wide tour of both uh, West Germany. And then we had an East Ber- or Berlin excursion. And so I, I was excited to be able to go and uh, tour Germany. Um, I had three years of German in middle school and then in high school and then in five years in college. And so I was always fascinated with the German culture and fascinated with East Germany because of the uh, regimentation. Uh, and uh, it seemed to to me, the East German legacy was carrying over from the, the National Socialists in some of the ways. And uh, I thought by visiting East Berlin and East Germany, I might get a flavor of that experience. And boy, did I. Yeah, yeah. Well, we will come to that uh, uh, shortly. So how old how old were you at this point? I, uh, I was 23 years old. I uh, What happened was I um, for a Christmas gift, my sister is an entertainer that maybe some people might remember Susan Anton. And and uh, you might remember her. Her uh, boyfriend for many years was Dudley Moore. Oh, and, wow. OK. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And, and so um, 1987, um, my, my girlfriend had broken up with me and I had a broken heart. And uh, my sister knew how, you know, upset I was. And, you know, that happens with love. And she said, hey, you know what? Open up this box for Christmas. And there were travel brochures. And she said, pick one. You're going to go. And so I did. I picked one. And uh, I set out on my venture uh, to Europe all on my own at 23. I didn't go with any friends or anything. It just went on my own. And uh, it was uh, it was a, a, a an experience, a treasure, actually. Right, right. So where where did the tour start from? Well, we we landed in Frankfurt, and uh, then we went from Frankfurt uh, up the, and then we went to the Rhine, and then we went up to the Moselle Valley, and then we went to Hamburg, and then from Hamburg we took the transit road into uh, West Berlin, and then from West Berlin I went to East Berlin, and then we went from. East Berlin down to um, Nuremberg and uh, the Romantische Straße or the Romantic Road and then down into Munich and then Munich into the Black Forest, Freiburg, and then up to uh, Frankfurt again to go home. Right. You really did the whole German experience then. (laughs) If you want to call it that, it's hard to do that in 12 days, but we we did the best we could. And I had a little bit of a delay in my trip that we'll go over. But yeah. uh, 
you know, we I, I'm dying to get back there. Yeah, yeah. No, great, great country. I'm I'm always uh, keen to travel there. What were your fellow travelers like? Very eclectic group. I had a, um, you know, a lot of retirees, some military retirees, by the way, too, that were uh, on a trip. Uh, there was a group of four uh, girls who were or women, I should say, that were working for a publishing house in New York City. So I was interested in all of them. Um, and then we had some 14, 13 year old kids of some of the families that were there. Um, it was, like I said, a very uh, eclectic group. Um, it wasn't. Um, it wasn't a very enthusiastic group. They, everybody was there. It was pretty boring, to be honest with you. They were just like looking out the window. And I liked going out at night when we were in uh, in Hamburg and we went to the Reeperbahn. I went, the tour guide was around my age, uh, uh, Justice, and we went out and partied pretty good with them and had a great time. Manfred, our bus driver, they were showing me, you know, when the tour was over, the fun started because everybody went to bed so early. And, you know, 23 years old and in Europe, I, I wanted to have some fun. Right. It sounds like I might have to do another interview with you about the fun you had after everybody <laughs> went to bed. That's that's a good story. <laughs> <laughs> well, we keep we we park that one for, for the for the moment. So you, you mentioned about traveling to West Berlin along the um, the transit th- route through uh, East Germany. What were you warned about before you you made that crossing? Yeah, you know, um, for us, it was uh, for me, I can't really speak for the others. But when our our tour guide came on, he said, we're going to be going into East Germany, because obviously, you have to go to East Germany to get to West Berlin. Mm -hmm. And he said, if you have multiple Bibles, if you have magazines or multiple magazines or newspapers that you're holding on to or whatever it is, um, you need to get rid of them. Um, You know, or they're going to they could confiscate them, they might not take them, they might take them. But they will go through your luggage and they will go through everything in here. And they, you know, so if you happen to have two Bibles in your in your uh, suitcase, um, then, you know, they might take one of them. But it might be your spouse's. So you know, make sure you're clear with that. But uh, they were, you know, the whole tone changed when uh, our driver, Manfred, was our driver. And, you know, he's driven that route numerous times. But every time he went into East Germany, uh, you know, they were following you, they were timing you, you had to stop at different places and spend West German or American currency at their, at their uh, stop and go markets where you can pick up snacks or newspapers. Or whatever. But when they boarded the bus and looked at our passport and everything and went, started going through your personal effects, I realized I was in a different world. Um, you know, when somebody can just go through your luggage because they want to, um, and then take stuff. I, they took uh, some newspapers from mine that I had, a uh, magazine Der Spiegel that I had, and, and everything. They they took that out, and um, it was a little disconcerting, I must say. I, I was realizing I was going into a whole different world. Yeah, yeah. And presumably, you know, when you flew into West Germany, there would have been a customs check, but nothing like what you experienced. Was it Helmstadt you crossed at? Yes. Yeah. Yes, it was in the north. Yes, it was where we, we recrossed. And, and yeah, I mean, we do have to go through, you know, security checks and even more intrusive now. But when they started taking your possessions, uh, when they started asking you your reasons for having it and your purpose for going into East Germany, you know, and you had to explain yourself, um, you know, coming from a tradition here in the States, we don't have to explain anything. You just do it. Um, and so it was a real um it was shocking for me to be honest with you. And I was, uh, let's just say I wasn't the most compliant. I, you know, I was uh, sarcastic and, and everything and they didn't really appreciate that, but I just didn't really seem to understand what I was getting into because uh, the tour company did not prepare you for that. There was nothing in regards to uh, don't take pictures while you're on the roads. Uh, be careful what you say to the guards. They, they didn't go over that anything with you. You you're just so you're American. You're just used to saying what's on your mind. Right, right. And you mentioned about currency. So you, you had to change a, a fixed amount then at the uh, the first checkpoint. Yes. And you had to and you were, you were required to spend it. Um, and because, you know, as 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 you know, East Germany was at 1987, they were going broke. So they needed as much hard currency as they could get. And so they were preferring that you actually spend American money. They didn't want you to change it so much into West German marks. So what what I did, and I'm glad I did it, is I took all my American currency and West German currency that I had, and I and I hid it. I put it in a money belt and everything uh, and, and had it all put away. And so they couldn't uh, have access to that. And um, But nonetheless, I still had to spend it. So I bought, you know, 
uh, sodas, chips, and uh, Neues Deutschland, an edition of Neues Deutschland, which I wish I still had. But uh, it was, uh, <laughs> you know, $25, it was $25 we were required to spend. And, and it really was a, a, a money-making scheme. Yeah, yeah. No, I remember struggling to spend my 25 Ostmarks on a day trip to uh, East Berlin. But uh, anyway, we're, we're here to hear your story, not mine. Um, so, so when you arrive at the end of the transit route, and you're entering West Berlin. How difficult w- was that? Because presumably they're trying to stop East Germans trying to get on your coach and and get into West Berlin. Yeah, we didn't. You know, the the, the transit roads were pretty wide open. That was uh, what this was disturbing for us. Is uh, behind us was a, you know, a, a police car. Um, I don't know if it, if it was Volkspolizei or whatever, but I do remember this blue flashing light behind us the whole way. And they were following us and their bus driver was extremely nervous about it. And the other thing is they would fine you if you exceeded the um, speed limit and, and you had to go to different checkpoints and spend your money again. So it wasn't like we just went to one mini market to buy something. We went to three. And so, you know, they would time you. And so if you left you know, at 11 o'clock, you better be at the next one at 1130, you know, and, and if you didn't make it, then the tour company would be fined and they would, you know, it, it was all a cash making scheme and, and having that pressure on you and having those three guards go on your bus and the mirrors and the guard dogs and them looking at the passport and then looking at you and looking at the passport again, it was just the, the stress and the, and the tension was something that it was palpable. You really felt it. And then when you went through, customs again to get into West Berlin, you know, you go through the same show again, and they ask you the same questions again. And what I didn't know is that the same questions are asking, they've already heard your responses from when you came in up in Hamburg or in uh, in that area. So if your answers deviated in any way, uh, they'll, they, they were going to delay the trip uh and your your entry so you better be clear on what you're saying and fortunately we got in and once we got through it was a big it was a big party we were celebrating we were we were happy because we felt this cloud just release and when we came up to berlin the interesting thing ian about that was when we came up to to west berlin we were surrounded by the sea of darkness and all you could see off in the horizon was this glow this bright glow and if anybody has ever flown into Las Vegas or been to Las Vegas at night, you can see that from a distance. And that's what West Berlin was. It was as if this jewel in the middle of darkness. And when we came in, it was it was wonderful. The, the streets were active. And it was like being in Los Angeles. It was like being in London. It was like, you know, there was there was a heartbeat. There was a pulse. There was a vibrance. There was happiness. And and you felt that you were on this island um, of sanity, if, you know, and, and it really was uh, very yeah, exciting yeah. to be there. Yeah, because I, I was going to ask you what you made of, of West Berlin. Did you, you know, what, what sites did you go and see when you were in West Berlin? Oh, wow. I, we went to the Pergamon. We went to the museum, Alta Pina Tech. We did that. Um, then we went to, um, you know, museum, uh, the Checkpoint Charlie Museum. Mm-hmm. We went to that. Uh, the Reichstag, uh, the Reichstag at that time was was uh, just basically a glorified museum that they had on the history of Germany, because there was no official residency in the Reichstag. Being the capital was in Bonn at the time, and so I went through that. Uh, we went to the presidential uh, mansion that was there, and, uh, and we went to um, you know the Soviet memorial that's there, that's in West Berlin, and we went to the Soviet memorial that was there. Um, and then we went to a, a cabaret and I had a Berliner Weisse, which is a great drink to have a strawberry version of it. And, and it was great. And, and I got to meet and talk with the people. Um, my, when, when the tour was over and at the night and then, uh, Manfred, Justin, Justin and I, we went to a, uh, <clears throat> you know, a, a bar and talked to some of the people. And, uh, I was able to talk to some of the college kids there who were around my age and, we were talking, having political discussions because, you know, at that time, you know, the big debate was on the nuclear freeze and the Pershing missiles in West Germany and and the, the growing threat of war. You know, Reagan's a warmonger, yeah. Gorbachev, all that dynamics were playing out. And uh, it was interesting because, uh, you know, I never really had been challenged uh, it, it before. And and it was neat to talk to talk to them about the politics and, and to argue about it. And that's healthy. I think that's healthy in a democracy is is to be able to 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 talk both sides without you can disagree in an agreeable way, but you can still root for the same team and be democratic. You know, and uh, it, was, it was interesting to see to see that. Uh, and then I 
most of those kids that were there uh, in West uh, Berlin, when I found out, they were saying the reason they were there is because if they lived in West Berlin, then they didn't have to serve their time in the West German Bundeswehr. And so I said, well, okay, so where's your commitment? What's your commitment to then? If you're here to escape that, then what do you believe in and what do you stand for? So it was fun yeah. to talk Yeah, about. no, I can imagine they were quite lively um, discussions there. Um Oh, they, they, well, they turned me on to a bunch of music though, too, uh, German music that was really popular. And, and, uh, I'm a fan of it even today. I listened to that, uh, Rio Reiser, Herbert Grunemeyer, you know, and, uh, it was, uh, it was, it was, it was fun. And, and to understand that and then speaking German as best as I can and understanding as best I can, when you listen to the music, that gives you, that really gives you a, a message into what they're thinking. And it's the best reflection of a culture that you can get. And I, and I treasure that gift they gave me that. Yeah. Day. Yeah. And where, where were you staying in West Berlin? At the hotel Hamburg in West Berlin. It was not too far from the, you know, oh, the right. So it's right in and, the uh, glitzy area. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You might find my um, episode interesting um, about the British music producer that worked in West Berlin. And he put on the first uh, amongst the first punk gigs in East Berlin. Um, I'll oh, send you details of that episode. You might find that interesting because it's very music orientated as well. Um, well, yes. It, well, the, you mentioned music. I mean, I, I was in Berlin um, in in July, and uh, I was uh, I left like the end of June, early part of July. And what it had just happened in in Berlin, two things, two huge things that had happened in, in West Berlin at that time was we all familiar with Reagan's tear down the wall speech. And that happened just a, two weeks prior to me coming there. So everybody in East Germany was already angry enough, but the other event that a lot of people forget about, or it was in May, David Bowie had a concert at the Reichstag and millions of people were attending that. And David Bowie had his concert, but what he also did was install speakers to blare over the wall into East Berlin. And so the East Berlin youth were thronging as close as they could to the Brandenburg Gate and to that area. And and uh, the Volkspolizei, Grenz, the Grenzpolizei were having to, uh, there was riots going on because uh, people were wanting to get over the wall to go to the concert and wanting to hear that. And, and David Bowie was very, uh, you know, strong into making sure that that music got blared over the wall into into uh, East East Berlin. So you had the David Bowie concert on top of uh, Reagan's speech, and you had even a, a more acutely uh, sensitive East German um, ego. Yeah. So that. you were crossing into possibly the perfect storm for what uh, happened next. Uh, That's for sure. So let, let's come on to your your crossing into East Berlin. So this was a a day tour which is just one of these standard tours that they were operating at the time what and you, you came in through checkpoint charlie and there was a, a little bit of a problem with your t-shirt <laughs> yeah that's what i was <laughs> going to mention that that the, the one of the other events that happened that spring if people remember there was that young west german matthias roost who flew his cessna into red square and somehow evaded soviet uh, the vaunted soviet air control system and everything and he, and he landed that little cessna in red square and got out and was arrested for hooliganism but um Everybody in West Germany and Der Spiegel, they just thought that was hilarious. They thought that was wonderful. And there was a sense of German pride in that, um, in, in a way, too. And and they had these uh, – the Germans are wonderful for their sarcasm. And uh, there were these T-shirts in German, but it had a picture of the Kremlin. And in German around it, it was written, now opening – International Airport Red Square, and it had a German Cessna uh, in in front of uh, in front of the Kremlin there, and it was a hilarious shirt. So I bought one, and everything, and so I thought, well, you know, we're going to East Berlin tomorrow. Let me wear that shirt, and uh, so I had that shirt on when we were going through our our, our uh, through Checkpoint Charlie, and they, you know, the American side, they just wave you through. There's no big deal. They just you log in and tell them what tour you are, what time you're in. And I think you had to be out by like 4.30 or something like that. There was the time you had to be out because if, to stay in East Berlin, you had to have an appointment and you had to register and all of that. We didn't do that. We were just there for a, a day tour. And so when they, they came on the bus and going through the same routine and they're looking at your passport and they're looking at you. And, and my passport was picture was a little bit different because when I had taken my initial passport um, picture, uh, my hair was long and a mustache and then. Um, I, I shaved all that off for, for the most part when I went on my trip. I didn't want to, you know, just, and so I didn't look like the same person on that. So they were questioning that to begin with. 
And then the guard looked and he stopped at me and he looked at my shirt and he said, uh, you can't wear that here. I said, well, I'll turn it in out. And he goes, no, you don't understand. You can't wear that here. Give it to me. And I said, what am I going to wear? He goes, that's not my problem. And, uh, and so I'm looking around him, you know, people on our trip goes, uh, yeah, I have an Indita sweatshirt. You can wear that a zip up shirt. You can wear that and everything, but I'm six foot seven, you know? And so it looks like whatever they're going to give me is going to look like a tube top. And I didn't want to, I didn't want to wear that, but the guard was funny. You know, when he saw that, he saw my shirt and he actually kind of laughed a little bit. He kind of chuckled to himself and he said, I'll be right back. And so he came back and he gave me this T-shirt and he says, wear this. And then the T-shirt had this hammer and sickle and it was said CCCP on it for, you know, yeah. Russian uh, for the Soviet Union. And uh, I had to wear that. And so I put that on and he took my shirt and um, and he, he marked, he, he, they were writing down and, and there was a, him and a gentleman behind him with a booklet and he was writing stuff down. So I'm I'm assuming they wrote stuff down about me and then they waved us through and uh, we went through the processing and the mirrors and all, all of the security checks that they do. Then actually after we got cleared to go through uh, checkpoint, Charlie and go into Berlin, um, our tour guide uh, from the West, just, just didn't justice. uh, He sat down and the East German tour guide got on and, uh, and he was in charge of the trip. You had a, a East German tour guide that was on our bus. And then he brought with him a gentleman um, uh, who I, you know, another additional person, he came in and kind of sat towards the back of the bus. And uh, this gentleman conducted a tour of East Berlin. Right. Tell me about your, your tour guide. I mean, d- presumably they were very much keeping to the East German party line and describing things in glowing Oh yeah. Ways. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was a propaganda tour and yeah, it, he, he got on and he was a, um, it was a pleasant sort. His English was excellent uh, and, and everything. He was a member of the SED, mm-hmm. the socialist Einheitspartei. And he had to be, uh, to do that. And, um, our, you know, our tour, just to be clear, our tour that we went over, we're all Americans. There was no Canadians or anybody else. We, we, it was pretty much everybody from our tour signed up to go. So we filled the bus up with our our team, and so to speak. So that was nice. And he got on there. And we, he was taking us around. We went to Trump Tower Park. We saw the, the Soviet uh, you know, cemetery there. Uh, and, and he was talking about the liberation of Berlin by the, the Soviet troops and how the glorious Soviet army liberated them from fascism and all of that. And uh, we, so we got the, the propaganda line of World War II. Um, but then he started, we went to the uh, the Palace of the Republic, and then we went to Unter den Linden, and we went to the Neue Wache, we went to the, the Rutas uh, Rathaus, so the Red you know, mm-hmm. City Hall, and and, uh, and it, it was fascinating to be there, and we went to a, a typical lunch, and, uh, you know, since we had to spend our, our West German money or 25 uh, marks that we had, you know, we ate like Kings because most of the people there didn't have that type of money. So, you know, you would order something and, and your portion, it was just a massive amount of food that you had. And, and some of the people that you were, when we were eating out in the, in the little beer garden there outside to eat and ordering it, um, they, it, it reinforced to the East Germans, this uh, decadent, uh, capitalist people who could just pay for money and get all this stuff. And, and I didn't realize it was reinforcing the stereotype, but the resentment that they had and people wouldn't talk to you, they wouldn't talk to you at all. You know, you, I was trying to engage them in conversation and, and everything, even in, you know, in German. And they were like, no, uh, I had on a, uh, uh, I had a warning that if anybody came and talked to you, that those people could be in trouble, uh, you know, for talking to you. And, and I just thought how, how odd that was. And, but our tour guide and I uh, got into a debate. He was saying America was imperialistic and wanted to bring a nuclear Armageddon to the world, that Reagan was a warmonger, that the United States was not, you know, in the community of nations as this, you know, as the Soviet Union and East German were. And, you know, we look out for the workers and he was talking about, you know, poverty and you don't see you don't see any um, you know slums or anything like that in East Berlin and the socialist system works and and I'm raising my hand. I'm going, what do you mean you don't see any poverty in East Berlin? You still have buildings you haven't fixed from World War II. What the hell are you talking about? And, 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 don't, and don't tell me about poverty. We got people that, that you know, can't eat lunch and look at us like we're, like we're rich and like they're working for food. You know, they, you know, they had a couple of people asking me for money. I said, you know, and I didn't give it to them. Uh, but uh, how is that a culture that you should celebrate? Or how are you any different from us then? You know, and, 
And then we got into the political debate and he was asking, you know, he's going on about Reagan. And then we got on the debate about the wall. And I said, well, if you're so open, free, why don't you allow free travel? He goes, we can, they can go to Czechoslovakia and Hungary and Moscow. Like, why can't they go to Paris or London or Washington or Los Angeles or Hollywood, Hollywood, you know? And I said, so you built your wall, you know, you built your wall to imprison people. And uh, he said, no, we built a wall to keep you out. And uh, not only do we want to build a wall to keep you out, we want to build a wall to keep your ideas out, too, because your ideas are inherently selfish and your ideas inherently are, are the enemy of the general good of the people. And listening to that, it was it was a wonderful experience to be able to debate that. And uh, meanwhile, as I was arguing with him back and forth, nobody else was engaging him. And I, and I liked doing it. I mean, I was a college student. I was, and back in those days, college students were taught to uh, – have free and open discussions and not just conform as we seem to see today, but we were able to to debate and ask, but that gentleman who was with him, his partner with him was, he was scribbling notes furiously as I was going back and forth with him. And, and I asked him who his friend was, he goes, well, he's just making sure I'm doing my job and a quality check that we're, uh, that we're representing our nations with honor and dignity and, and everything. And, uh, you know, I had no had no idea that the gentleman behind me scribbling notes worked for the Stasi, and I, I yeah, found that out. Yeah, yeah, and I remember you you saying before that you you reached some sort of uh, agreement around World War Two at Treptow Park because of your father's story, didn't you? Yes, I mean we were we were you know arguing uh, you know at lunch, and then after lunch we went to Treptow Park and we were there, and uh, I went and bought some because I had to spend my money. So I went and bought some flowers and I I placed some uh, red roses, uh, a bouquet of red roses. I placed at the uh, entrance into the uh, Trep Tower Park there in in honor of their sacrifice. Um, You know, say what you want, but the the Soviet soldiers, uh, the sacrifice of the Soviet Union is undeniable. You you can't, Mm. you can't argue that. And, 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 and doing that, they were, they said, why are you doing that? And I said, well, my dad fought in World War II. My dad fought all the way from France, all the way into Germany, all the way into Czechoslovakia. And, and my dad was an occupation duty in West Berlin. And uh, they said, well, you know, in honor of your dad, uh, and he killed, his, he killed fascists. And I said, yes, he did. And they said, well, let's see, we're on the same page. We want it. We don't want that to happen again. And and, and, and I said, they said, that's why we need to let Europeans run it. And I said, well, we'll let Europeans run it as soon as you get your Soviet troops out of East Germany, leave Germany alone. And, and uh, you still have your troops here. We still have our troops here. And he was, well, you know, there, we were on the same page for a little bit there, Todd. But, you know, once you started arguing about your hero, Reagan, you lost us again. But there is hope. There is hope. And that hope rests. And when we fight evil together, we can do great things. And there's no arguing with that, but it was interesting how quickly uh, they seized on me, you know, just laying flowers there out of respect, uh, uh, you know, and, and my dad would talk to me about some of the troops he met in, uh, in Berlin when he was on occupation duty. And, you know, the, uh, there, there's a stereotype of the animalistic, uh, barbarous behavior of the Soviets in, in uh, Berlin. And that's definitely true, but the gentlemen, you know, people he came into contact with, um, were fascinated. He said the funniest thing he saw at this time there was uh, they they had strawberries and and they were washing the strawberries in the toilet. They didn't really understand what a toilet was and they they put the handle down and flushed their strawberries down the toilet. And he said it's the funniest thing you ever saw. They didn't know what that was. I mean, and he just thought how amazing uh, being in the service was to take him from a small little town in California, and here he is flushing strawberries down the toilet with Soviet troops. It's amazing the journey one's life can lead to. And when I talked to my tour guide about that and it's, you know, it, it was a real human exchange face to face and it, it made it less uh, argumentative and you're like, well, you're, you're people too, you know? And, and it was a um, intensely personal experience. And, it, and I really, I really enjoyed it. I wish more people, well, in that sense, we're having the conversation, not interrogation, but uh, having that kind of conversation with somebody else that leads to a lot of mutual understanding and breaking down a lot of barriers. So yeah, it's- no, it's in, it's interesting there that you know you did find that that common ground there over the, you know, when you know we were allied and the U.S. were allied with the Soviet Union fighting Nazi Germany. No, that that's really interesting. So you do the tour and then you're back at Checkpoint Charlie. Right. Well, one of the what what happened was on the as we were it was uh we were getting ready to leave. And we went, our last stop before we went to Checkpoint Charlie was at the, uh, 
the Neue Wache or mm. New Watch, where they changed the guards and the goose stepping guards are there. And uh, inside of there was the eternal flame to, at that time, the eternal flame to the victims of militarism and fascism that they had. And, uh, you know, it was you know, like the changing of the guard there, like we see at the Arlington Cemetery here that, you know, the guards at Buckingham Palace, uh, you know, it was it was their pageantry. And I wanted to see that. And it was very amazing. So I got off the bus and went over to the Neue Vaca to uh, take you know pictures of the changing of the guard. And we got out there and our gr- American group, a few of us got off the bus, maybe about 10 of us did. And we got over to the Neue Vaca and we're standing on the steps there and they're changing in the garden. It was, you know, a few of us there, but there were... Um, other people there from uh, it was interesting they were from uh, vietnam uh north korea and china and uh nicaragua and here was the, these americans here and and they were looking at us like we were from mars I, I and but anyway they they changed the they changed the guard and i thought that was just fabulous to see and then on the street right in front just uh along uh winter day linden pulled up this uh German uh, deuce and a half or this East German truck and it had the canvas on the back and the typical, like you see in the military. And I'm like, well, that's pretty cool. And look at that. And, and, and there was all full of soldiers in the back, uh, the uh, NVA mm-hmm. soldiers, uh, uh, national folks, army soldiers. And, and they were towing a, on the flatbed uh, trailer, they were towing like an armored personnel carrier, an APC. And, and I'm like, that's really cool. So I left my group over there taking pictures and I walked over to them and I started taking pictures of them. And I started taking pictures of the of the the armored personnel carrier. I started taking pictures of that, and, uh, and then I went back to my group. Not nobody said anything, uh, but I, I took pictures of that because here in the states, you know, we see military equipment going up and down our road all the time. You know, and we take pictures of that, and it's you know, I mean, you, and you interact with the soldiers and talk with them, and nobody said or yelled anything at me. And I went back over to our group and and saw the soldiers take their place and. I was I was pretty I was pretty cool. It was pretty impressive to watch that. And then we got back on our bus and uh wasn't thinking anything about it. Uh we were leaving early because uh this day was the fourth of July. And so our tour guide was going to host us on a fourth of July. We we're gonna have a hot dogs and hamburgers and a typical American dinner and, and uh they were gonna take us over to um, you know, the fireworks show and all of that in, in honor of uh our fourth of July. And um so we were all looking forward to that. And so we were going through Checkpoint Charlie and um, I, I had on my Russian T-shirt and I was sitting there and the guards got on the bus and uh, they were going through checking everybody's passport. They didn't check mine. I'm like, and I held my passport up. I'm like, here, here's mine. And no, nope, nothing. And so they got off and then um, all of a sudden uh, this group four to six people in um, Grinch Troop and, and then these gentlemen in gray uniforms. And I don't know what, they look like AK 47s. I'm sure the Germans had their own version of it, whatever it was, but they had their uh, machine guns on their back. Like you see, and they came on the bus and they looked at me <laughs> and they said, mit kommen. And yeah. it means you're coming with me. And I went, no, I'm not. <laughs> and mit kommen, you know, stay off mit kommen. And then I went, no, and uh, no, I'm not going to go with you. And, uh, they didn't, you know, tell me what I did or anything like that. They just said, you're going to go with me. And then they looked at our tour guide, our, our West German tour guide who was leading us. And he says, you know, the protocol and take care of it and contact your people. And then they reached down and uh, it's almost it, it's hard to talk about sometimes, but it, it's um, they reached down and grabbed me by the collar of my Russian T-shirt, ripping the collar and little, literally dragged me off the bus. And uh, I said, no, I'm not going. I didn't do anything wrong. I'm not going. And they pulled me off the bus and I'm standing there and they had their weapons and their weapons were pointed at me. And uh, I've never been so scared in all my life. I I was, I couldn't believe what was happening and their weapons were pointed at me. And uh, I stood there and watched my bus go through to West Berlin, go to the other side. And I have never felt more alone Mm -hmm. in my life than when I stood there with those East German guards with their guns at me. And I watched our bus leave and I felt utterly helpless, utterly alone. And, uh, I, I didn't know what the hell I had done. And, uh, I was at their and mercy. What, I mean, what was going through your mind at that, at that point? What, what did you think was, was going to happen to you? I thought I was going to get my, my butt kicked in. I thought I had no idea. I mean, the, the way they pulled me off the bus and how physical they were at that time, they weren't very mm-hmm. kind. And let me tell you that. And, and uh, so, yeah, no, they, 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 you know, took me off the bus. They dragged me off the bus. And 
what was going through my mind is they were speaking German so fast, I couldn't understand it, you know, and, and I was scared and terrified. And so I didn't have the chance to really concentrate on what they were saying. But all, all I heard was, um, you know, the questioning. I heard, take them for questioning. And so I, I just saw our bus go. I, there was, you know, I, I was alone. And then they pulled, you know, they, they drove these Trabants, these little teeny cars, you know, and I'm six foot seven. And it's really hard to fit in the back seat of a Trabant, let me tell you that. And they took and they pretty much pushed me into the back of that and slammed my head against a frame of the car doorway getting in the back. And then they had to be put on these uh I, you know, these uh, patches over your eyes, like you want to, when you want to sleep on the plane, you put those, you know, black, you know, blackout, you yeah, know, blindfold. things over your eyes. Yeah. So they put, they made me put those on. And then we went on a drive for, um, I want to say a half hour or something like that. We went on a drive and I can, there, I was, I knew I was in a police car cause I could hear the radio. And my dad was a police officer here in the States back in those days. So, I mean, I, I knew I was with police officers. I didn't know what I had done. And I was and then I was, you know, trying to calm down and I wasn't I wasn't crying or anything. I hadn't got to that point. You know, I, I would just and I wasn't saying anything. Uh, you know, I wasn't going to say anything. I, I kept telling my mind in myself is anything you say is going to make it worse. Just shut your mouth. Just shut your mouth. Anything you say is going to make it worse. So they um, they took me and drove me around and then um, they walked me into or one person. I was one side, another person on the other side under my armpits and were kind of leading me into an, uh, a room and then they took my my eyes you know they took my blinders off and uh they took me into this office and uh sat me down in this wooden chair and told me to put my hands under my thighs palms down hands under my thighs and to look straight ahead and uh you know and and they'll be right with me so i'm sitting in this office you know this room and the only light that's on in the room is this like over desk lamp that's on and then there's this window behind the desk lamp the blinds are shut but you can make out the sunlight coming through the blinds you know on either side mm. and so i knew that we still you know and, and it gets so it stays light so late in europe you know in the summertime um so i it's still light and i'm sitting there and then all of a sudden the door just booms open this person comes down and sits down and he starts asking me questions. Why are you in Berlin? Why are you here? You know, do you have friends here? Do you know, you know, asking me all these series of questions. And I'm like, no, I'm on a tour. I said, you have my camera, develop my film and you can see I'm on a tour. I don't know what I did wrong, you know? And, and they're, they said, uh, they finally told me what I had done wrong. And they said that I was uh, defiant, disrespectful, um, argumentative, uh, and a threat to the social fabric of the German Democratic Republic. And then they said that I took forbidden photos. And, and uh, then, you know, then he was trying to struggle with what he wanted to say. And uh, he said, you know, what you, and I said, well, in German to him, I said, who in the hell parks their who who in the hell parks their their military equipment in front of a tourist area and doesn't expect pictures? I mean, what, how stupid is that? Well, that's not that's not really what you say to people that are interrogating you. And then uh, he proceeded to tell me that uh, you know your American smart mouth needs to be shut, and he proceeded to hit me, uh, uh, slap me across the face with the back of his hand pretty hard. And at that moment, you 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 just don't realize how precious your rights are you know in a, in a free and democratic society you, you know the rights of the accused are are to me sacred they're they're special and here i was i had nobody advocating for me nobody looking out for me and everything and every time a person would ask me a question you know human nature you would turn your head and you would look at them and talk to them and they kept telling me no don't look at me look at the picture they wanted me to focus on the picture, look straight ahead and sit up. And I, you know, I had to go to the bathroom. I was thirsty and I, no, you can't go. You're staying here. You, you, no, you can't go. You can't take a break. You have to stay here. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 hours later, I'm still sitting there and they're still rotating people through asking me these questions. And I had to stare at this damn picture of Eric Honecker the whole time, you know, and it's that real famous one where, you know, he's wearing his black rim glasses and all of that. And, and I had to stare at this guy and, and I knew who he was. I mean, I, I, you know, I was a major history major in school and, and I knew who this guy was. And, and I had lots of friends, you know, from West Germany that had been, you know, going to college with and everything and, and all of that. But I, I had to stare at that picture. And, uh, 
that's the only thing I remember in that, that desk lamp. They turned it up and just stared it into my face. And all I could really make out was, you know, the silhouettes and the dull lighting of the room. But the room had this linoleum, avocado green. And, you know, it was 1980s, but it seemed like a 1970s throwback, you know. And and I'm like, you know, I, I just in my mind, even though I was, you know, I had just been slapped um, <laughs> in my mind, I'm like, who decorated this place? This is pretty pathetic. <laughs> and, 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 uh, I just, uh, I kept my mind focused on not saying anything anymore, but they kept asking me the same questions in different ways. And I, and I responded to them in different ways. And I said, well, what, what is it I can do? I, I told you I was here on a tour. I told you, you know, and it ended up being close to nearly 20 hours of nonstop interrogation. And I saw the, the window go dark and I knew it was night. And, uh, and, and then I saw that, haze of the morning light coming through and I knew it was the next day, July 5th. And, um, you know, that it was, it was just, it was scary. Yeah. It was absolutely. Scary. I mean, that, that, what, what you've just described there is, a a, a terrifying experience because as, as you describe, you know, you think that you have rights, but in a country like East Germany, there aren't, well, those rights could be taken away very quickly. And I guess the, um, you know, you being hit must have come as a, a massive shock to you. Yeah, it 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 did. I, and and you know, I don't like to you know talk about it too much. I'm embarrassed about it. Um, you know, I mean, I have older brothers. <laughs> I have older brothers, and uh, if you have older brothers, you hit each other all the time. And you know, I mean, that sense, but you expect it um, in that in that relational sense. But it was it, it was so so uh, shocking to me, and and in, in sharing my experiences here with you, and 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 then working on a on a book about it with other Americans who've gone through similar experiences. Um, what was uh, so upsetting about it for me, uh, and what brought me to the point of talking about it is, you know, if you remember recently, uh, we America had that uh, Otto Wambier, who was that kid in North yeah. Korea who, uh, you know, who allegedly took a poster and, and then the, the government took him in and then they, they just tortured him and he came back a, a vegetable. And, uh, but the videos of the North Korean troops pulling him around, leading him around and everything like that. Um, you know, I really talked about it too much, but when I started seeing those, the news that, that brought it all back yeah. in, and, and, and for me, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't sleep. I could still see the the green hat of the of the Grenztruppe uh, DDR I can still see the cuff that says Grenztruppe the DDR I can still the the Stasi interrogator I can still see him talking to me and and I can see you know the I I just it comes back from time to time it comes back and uh, I found and I was talking to friends of mine who you know war, World War II veterans and veterans all through and they said Todd that's that's PTSD you're talking about and I said no, you guys went through war you know he goes you don't have to go through war to have PTSD mm-hmm. You know, uh, victims of violent crime have PTSD. And he goes, you know, you were a victim. And I'm like, no, I got my, my smart mouth got me in trouble. And he goes, uh, no, you were it was you were thinking it was a good give and take. You were just being you're just being you. And if anybody, if anything, they were being defensive. But when seeing the news with Otto Van Beer coming back, it, it brought it all back to me. And so I decided to write about it. And it's been cathartic to do that. Talking to you is cathartic to do that. But I'm always so worried about being judged. You know what kind of a man allows himself to be hit and doesn't do anything well, about it? That, that, there's no absolutely no judgment there what, what, whatsoever. I mean, I'm I'm honoured, and I'm sure the listeners will feel honoured that you've you know shared your your story with us and been so open and honest about your experiences. And there's absolutely nothing ashamed of or or um, I don't I don't know. I, I'm I'm amazed. I mean, one of the things that I wrote down whilst you were talking there was that I was amazed that you, you know, retained your sense of humor in terms of thinking about the decoration of the room and how, and how bad it was. Yeah. Well, to me reminded, we had a real popular show here in America growing up. It was called the Brady Bunch. And, and it, and it, and it was a 1970s family. And I'm like, the next thing, this guy's going to come here and he's going to have a perm going on. And, you know, or, and I was trying to, you know, humor is always important to me. It keeps me, it keeps me, uh, going and and all i kept thinking about at that time was you know just quit saying anything uh but when i answered him and and uh the one of the last uh, guys who came in to talk to me one of the last stasi interrogators came in to talk to me his english wasn't very good and 
and I said, uh, how can I help you? You know, I said, is there, you know, is there, you and I, in German, I started speaking German to him and that cost me about another five hours. He's like, well, you speak German, you must be CIA, you must be a spy. And I'm like, well, if this is the German you think the CIA speaks, then, you know, we really have a lot of work to do because my German is just good enough to get by, uh, you know, and, but we you know that, that just caused them to be they, basically what it was. Um, the way I understood it uh, was this was just nothing more than a shakedown. They wanted to intimidate me. So I would go back and spread that, disseminate that fear amongst other potential tourists into American tourists into East Berlin. They didn't want them there. Uh, they were self-conscious about, you know, whatever messages we had to deliver or our money or whatever it may be, because the seeds of the Venda or the seeds of the change in East Germany were, were growing very strong, especially in Leipzig and, and all of that. So they were aware of that. And so they were trying to keep us or trying to keep any Americans out through intimidation. And then they wanted. And so they took everything that I had. I mean, they took my camera, they took my passport, they had my shirt still. And, uh, and then, um, it, it, in my, the one thing that, that uh, I didn't want to let them take was my dignity. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm just like, I, and I was argumentative. Um, and what I found out is one of the, the, their um, trainings that they have for Stasi and what they have is the, the more argumentative you are or the more indignant you are to them, that means that you're innocent. Uh, people who are guilty, you know, cry or, 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 or quiet or, you know, or, or apologetic and everything like that, 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 that their training says that that is an admission of guilt. Well, I didn't apologize for anything because I didn't know what I was apologizing for. And in, in doing that was a, um, a signal to them that I was legitimately a tourist who, who just, um, was unwelcome and, and all of that. And so when I heard, when I heard them, um, talking about the, the group of officers came back in and they were talking and I can make out what they were. I could hear that I was going to be released and so I was kind of I was I was excited about that, of course, but I wasn't demonstrating that assignment. And then all I had to I had to sign a um, uh, a certi or an Alf Clarung or some kind of uh, statement, and uh, and it said on the statement that I was a uh, 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 enemy of socialism, findest de socialismus. I, I had to declare that I was an enemy of socialism, and then I would not return to the GDR. And if I did, I would be subject and, and, and would be imprisoned. Uh, and, and, all, and I had to sign that statement. Well, two things. There was no way in hell I ever wanted to go back to the GDR that way. And then the other thing, to, to declare myself an enemy of socialism was something I was and still proud to say I did. And so I, I signed that. And they said, OK. And they took me out. And I thought I was in a totally different location. But I was still in Checkpoint. I was still in the East Berlin side of Checkpoint Charlie. I thought they took me on that car ride to disorientate me to think I was somewhere else. And, and so I'm like, I'm in the same place. Where'd you take me? You know, and I was just confused with that. Yeah. And then the, the um, kid, the soldier who took me to, uh, to the other side of the wall, he was the same one that uh, was on the bus who told me I couldn't wear the shirt. And so I had his CCP shirt on or his uh, USSR shirt on and he had a bag and he goes, this is your stuff. And so he was walking me out to to the gate, so to speak, to go over to the other side. And he got to a point where he had to stop and um, or he'd be shot and uh, or, you know, something would happen to him. He, you know, he said, I can only go to here. So he set the bag down. He goes, that's yours. And I looked in the bag and I can see my shirt. And I said, well, thank you for my shirt. And he goes, I hate the Russians, too. <laughs> and I found that to be extremely interesting. Um, and, and he laughed and he winked at me and he walked away. My camera was gone. My money was gone. Everything that I had was gone. My credit card gone. All, all I had was my driver's license and my passport. Everything else was gone. And except that shirt. Uh, and so I uh, looked over and I saw through the opening there, there was a, a black car there with two gentlemen outside of it. And they were waving at me. And Todd, Todd over here. And on the hood was the uh, flag, you know, American flag on the hood. And on the other side of the hood was, uh, I'm trying to remember now if it was the Berlin or the West German flag. And, and, and uh, but none, nonetheless, the American flag looked pretty dang good to me. And, and so I had to go to the bathroom so bad. They wouldn't let me go to the bathroom. It had been 20 something hours, you know. And wow. so I get through the gate and they came over and they shook my hand. And I told them, I said, guys, I really got to go to the bathroom. I really got to. And, I, and so I, I just, I went over to the side of the wall and, 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 and all of that. And then um, as you turn to walk back, 
you know, they're, they're towers, they're guards, and they all have their binoculars up and they're all looking at you and they're, they're maybe 50 yards away. You know, they're not that far away, a hundred yards away. They're not that far away. Mm. And all the anger and injustice I had it. And I just started screaming at them and I won't use the language I used here on your podcast, but I was screaming at them a few words that started with the letter F and my feelings about Honaker, my feelings about them. And, and the uh, American state department junior officer who was over there, he was no, not, not much older than me. I think he just got lunch duty with me or whatever it was. But anyway, um, he, you know, they were laughing pretty hard and uh, they got in the car and then we went back to uh, the American consulate there and they debriefed me and, uh, you know, wrote down whatever it was they debriefed me. And then uh, I said, now where do I go? My tour is on its way to Nuremberg. And uh, he said, well, that's a, you know, we'll get you down there. We have a, a, a car that's going down on the Southern Transit Road. We always have people coming and going. You'll just catch a ride with them. I've already called your tour company and they've alerted to your guy to pick you up at the, uh, to, to pick you up at the train station there in Nuremberg. And we'll just drop you off there. And okay, so we did that. And so we're, I, I was, um, I was exhausted. I got in the car and we started to drive uh, down to uh, Nuremberg or to the south. And, 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 I, and it finally came out and I was in tears and, and I was crying and, and I just I just fell asleep. And then when we finally got to the border to go from East Germany into West Germany, they're down you know, by the Nuremberg area. I think Rudesheim was the name of the city we went to first. Uh, but the uh, German border guard, the East German border guard was tapping with his ring on the window, that tap, tap sound on the window. And I opened my eyes and saw that uniform again. I jumped. I literally jumped. I could feel like electricity going through my body. And it was just as if I had gone through this all over again. And he said, don't show him anything and don't, you know, just hold up your passport. And I'm whole, you know, he held up his diplomatic um, identification papers and they just waved you through. They didn't even go through your trunk. They didn't go through anything because you're diplomatic, you had diplomatic immunity and they didn't do that. So you just drove right through. And then once we got through that um, and got into West Germany, I was, I was a wreck. I was crying and I was so thankful and I was you know, telling this guy, you know, thank you. <laughs> and then when my tour, when I hooked up with my tour, you know, everybody was kind of uh, worried about me because they didn't know what I did. I don't know if they thought I was some drug dealer or whatever it was I was doing. And I told them my story, what had happened. And uh, they just said, well, the lesson learned is to shut your damn mouth, kid. And that's what some of the veterans on the trip were saying. And they were giving me a hard time. But those four girls that were working from New York City, they all thought I had a rest record. So uh, they, for some reason, they thought that was good. So we had a good time. But uh, the rest of the tour went off without a hitch, but I lost my pictures. And some of the people had sent me pictures back from the trip. Uh, I have a really cool picture of me at Trep Tower Park. I think you saw it in the article that I had yeah. sent to you. And one, I was at Bernauer Strasse um, at the wall on the west side, looking over into the death strip and all of that. But uh, that was a that was a unique experience and and one I don't suggest anybody have again. But it sure made me appreciate it. And when that wall came down, I tell you, I wanted to be back there so bad. I wanted to go back there so bad. But I eventually did make it back there. That is just, um, I'm literally lost of words, Todd. That was such an amazing story and so honest and raw with it as well. I mean, it, 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 I am literally lost for words and most listeners will know this doesn't happen that, <laughs> that often, but I am so appreciative of you, um, sharing that story, um, and it, it's been an absolute honor to talk to you. Well, I, I appreciate that. The, you know, the, the satisfaction uh, from that came when I went back to Berlin in 2006. I think Germany with the World Cup there. And I was touring. Uh, my dad had passed away. My dad passed away on of all days, June 6, 2002 on D-Day. And so my dad always asked me to take his ashes back to Omaha Beach. And I did that. So I, I, my friend and I, we, we took the train back to Berlin. And I went to the scenes where what happened to me to kind of get those ghosts out of my head. And none of that exists anymore. I mean, uh, checkpoint Charlie is nothing but a tourist trap, but we were there. <laughs> and uh, a lot of these East Germans, former East Germans uh, have these tables where they're selling their uniforms and flags and everything like that. And I went over to this table cause I saw a lot of familiar looking items from the uniforms for the Stasi. And I went over there and the old guy said, Oh, my young man, are you American? And I said, yeah. And he goes, you came to the right table. We, I was part of the team that protected our country from 
for security and safety. And I was in the ministry of state security and we protected our country. And I just looked at the guy and I said, you're nothing but a son of a bitch. Let me tell you what you did. And I was really upset. And my friend came over and he says, Todd, 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 Todd. He didn't do that. And I said, I don't care. He did. His unit did. His people did this and, you know, and everything. And so I talked to him about what went through there. And he said, you shouldn't have opened your damn mouth, kid. And and I said, well, you, you could have treated people differently. And anyway, it, it was, uh, you know, it was a little bit of that PTSD, whatever you want to call it, but that spirit that came into me. And the gentleman grabbed a, 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 an East German flag, a, a Russia Soviet flag, and a Stasi cap that he was trying to sell, and he gave it to me. And I said, I don't want this. I don't want this at all. He goes, take it. It's my gift to you. You won. You won. We lost. <laughs> and I have those items in my classroom at my school. And then that the kind of helped end my uh, my whole uh, German experience. Yeah, college. I guess it was some somewhat cathartic being able to yell at this guy who was a representative <laughs> of the Stasi. Yeah, but I'm the one that looked like an idiot. I'm the one who's standing there just, you know, just going off on him and everything like that. But uh, come to find out, you know, and a couple of people came over and they're like, are you OK? And they were Germans. And I told them what had happened, you know, and all that. And then and I said, I just don't know why you allow this stuff to be sold. I, I, I don't, you know, I, to me, it was, uh, it's a, it's a symbolic, uh, you know, of oppression and all of that. I don't know why you allow this to be sold and everything, but I have it in my classroom and I, I look at it from time to time and I, you know, uh, we're doing a, uh, I teach my kids about, uh, East Germany and the communists and socialism and things like that so that they're not attracted to the, uh, the socialist or totalitarian movement because, once you give it up, it's very hard to get it back. Yeah, I was going to say it would be really interesting if we could track down that that border guard who hand, who handed <laughs> your bag back. Um, <laughs> I wish we could. I, I wish there was a way to do it because I, I swear he wasn't much older than me. Most of the people I were, was interacting with, except for the interrogators, were, were all my age. You know, and, and they they had to be, I mean, they had, they were forced to be in the NVA. They had to do their duty time and all of that. They had to do it. And so I was at the same age as they were and, and everything. So yeah, it would be, it would be nice. I, I, you know, it's been since 1987, I'm sure all that paperwork's long gone. I wish I could get that statement that I signed that I'm an enemy of socialism. I'd love to get that framed. Well, I was going to I was going to say, I mean, have you there must be a Stasi file. on. I there. have no idea. I, I have no idea if there is. I, I have um, written to uh, the document section and stuff in Berlin looking for that. And there 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 isn't any there isn't anything on that, really. Um, you know, they're really, really it's so right. long ago. And it was it, and, and then come to find out in the research I'm doing for my book, th those things that happened to me happened a lot. I uh, quite a few uh, people that um, were. Uh, interrogated and briefly. And it was just, it was just a customary shakedown. The only thing that was different for me is that I, they held me overnight. So they had to notify the, uh, the American authorities, because again, you know, uh, all Americans needed to be out by a certain time if they didn't have proper paperwork, you know, allowing them to be there and, and everything. And so they notified right. uh, the government where I was at. That's how they knew when to pick me up and all that. So, like I said, um, it was just a shakedown out here in California. We have that when we drive down to Mexico and the Mexican police pull you over, they can either write you a ticket or you give them cash and they let you on your way. And uh, people give them cash and they go on their way. And that's pretty much what I was told by the American officials is that they, it was just a way to shake you down, to scare you, to spread disinformation and to get money from you. And, uh, and I said, well, they didn't get mm -hmm. much money from me because uh, my belt, they never took my belt off. Had they taken my belt off, they would have seen all my money because I had it in one of those. All oh, right. So you so you had that on all the time, and uh, they never they never fully searched you. No, not on my belt. They just thought a belt's a belt. They hadn't thought about that. I had my shoes were off. They had me take my shoes off. Right. And and my shoes were off. And I and I guess that's one of the reasons why they went, you know I don't know they're you're going to go to the bathroom. They're worried that you're going to kill yourself or something or whatever. You, you know they don't. I don't know how that works. But what I do know that works is just the sheer. Uh, it, it's not the mental, it's not the physical abuse that, that hurt. It's, it's the mental, it's them, the constant questioning and then asking it in a different way. And then in, in a different language. And then, you know, you, and then you, you get, you're so tired and they want you to be tired because then you'll slip up or you might reveal information mm -hmm. or anything that you're hiding. And, 
and all I kept saying is, I just want to go home. I, you know, I just said, I just want to, I just want to go home. I just want to get out of here. Yeah. Because what you've described is, I mean, I've been to the, uh, the Stasi prison at Hohen Schoenhausen and the tours they do there. Um, it's often somebody who was actually in prison there. And the procedure that you've described, described is almost exactly what um, I, I heard from them, you know, particularly this, um, palms under your thighs, look straight ahead, and the repetition, somebody else coming in, asking the same questions to make sure that you're still going to um, stick with that, absolutely echo um, the experience that, that you've described. And it, and it sounds like, you know, by you being argumentative, you probably might have saved a day under their custody, you know, in, in so much they realized your innocence within a day. Right. It, it, it's, um, you know, it's that when I did some research and starting to do the research in this, I mean, even though I have my master's degree in World War II studies and everything, my my uh, passion is grown into the whole German time of, you know, the East Germany, West Germany. And I'm really fascinated with that because I, I'm a, I, I lived it, so to speak, and I am emotionally connected to it. Mm. And what I found in some of the Stasi, um, I read uh, there were actually PhD dissertations written by potential Stasi officers on on how to mentally break people, and 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 how and how quickly you can do that. And uh, they were saying that you know somebody who is guilty, you know, uh, you can break them within simple hours through various questionings and and threatening threatening them too. You know, if you don't reveal your information, we'll put your children into state care and adoption and you'll never see them again. You know, those kind of threats that they would do. Um, it, it was very effective. And, but one of the things he was saying in, in that dissertation was, you know, ang- you know, the more angry or argumentative you are and those kind of things demonstrate uh, a degree of innocence and uh, it, that, that they should recognize and be aware of. Um, then that's, I, I guess I, I, I fulfilled that. So I'm, I'm, maybe my smart mouth got me in. Got me out of that one, Ian. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe. I mean, I, it's interesting because the, the, when when you described taking photos of that truck and the armor personnel carrier, that is probably something they wouldn't expect a tourist to do necessarily. And and I I can't remember when I went to East Berlin whether there was advice about don't take photos of the military apart from the Neue Wacker and railway stations and bridges and and things like that. But it sounds like you you, you never had that advice. No, there, there's two things. Number one, maybe I didn't get that advice. And maybe number two, I was 23 years old and maybe I wasn't listening to, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. There is, there is, there is that. It's a bit like you know the safety drill and stuff like that. You know, you you tune out. I've been some teaching degree. thirty years in the classroom, and I believe me, I know when kids are listening and not listening. And I've been a husband for thirty years too, and I know when I'm listening and not listening too. So uh, that does, that doesn't mean that doesn't mean they didn't do it. Um, but um, I I I there's a uh, fascination somehow uh, that I want to get back there. I really want to take my family back to. Berlin someday, uh, and, 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 and to take them and let them see that because, um, you know, a lot of this story I've kept in, you know, my, my wife, she's like, uh, you, I met my wife in 1988 and, uh, a year after that, but I didn't talk to her too much about it, mm. you know? And so she's like, I, 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 I can't believe you went through that. And uh, yeah, I did. And, uh, I wish I could take him back there. I wish I can show him that. And, and I must say that in, in, uh, and I don't want to waste your time here. I know we've gone on a long time, but I, I really mm-hmm. feel uh, the that I teach that I think people need to understand is how courageous and how brave the East German people were to they they are the ones who took down the wall. It wasn't the Russians. It wasn't us or the Americans. It wasn't the West. It was it was them. It was the East Germans themselves who took it upon themselves at the threat of the, of the, the army and the threat of the Stasi and the threat of the abuse and the threat of arrest and death to bring that wall down themselves. And, and they kept chatting, uh, wir sind das Volk, we are the people. And uh, every time I, uh, and I see that in, a, in movies or, and I see that on YouTube or whatever that night when they opened the gate and were chatting, uh, you know, wir sind das Volk, we are the people. I can't think of anything more inspiring to hear than that. And, and, and at that moment, when that wall came down 
when they raised uh, the arm at uh, Bonhomer Strasse and people came through, at that moment, for me, I think World War II ended for the German people. And I think World War II finally was over and they were able to determine their own future and they were able to define what freedom means to them, not what America wants it to mean for them or what anybody, but the German people themselves can do that. And so the real, the real unifiers of the German nation were those East German citizens themselves who were very, very courageous and I have the utmost admiration for them. Yeah. No, absolutely. And, and you know, also in other countries in Eastern Europe, you know, like Václav Havel in Czechoslovakia and Lech Walesa in, in Poland, you know, when they were going up against the state, they knew that they would be, you know, interrogated, put under pressure, tried to be blackmailed. And, you know, that it's interesting because, you know, the the, the East German interrogation techniques appear to evolve from more f- less physical threat to more psychological around your kids won't go to university they won't get a job you know that that more indirect um threat rather than physical threat although obviously you did get you did get hit and i'm not you know trying to uh you know denigrate that or um undermine that no no well, like er- Erich Milke, uh, you know, who was the, the the father of the Stasi, of this, the, the, you know, he um, he uh, based their operational system on the uh, from the Gestapo, mm. um, and there were a lot of members, former Gestapo members, um, once they were cleared, uh, you know, in as far as the Communist Party and SED and all of that, but there were a lot of former Nazi officials in security services, whether it was SS or whether it was a, a, a Gestapo that worked to develop the new security system. And uh, it's, it's argued that the, um, the Stasi were more effective than any, uh, than any Gestapo ever was. Yeah. And uh, I, I wouldn't know about the Gestapo, but I know about the Stasi and uh, there were, let me tell you, they were, they were true believers. It wasn't like they were doing a job. They, they, were, they were true believers. They really believed in the system, and, and, uh, and they, they wanted to preserve the system. And they really perceived me as a, a, an existential threat. Mm. I was really the enemy. I wasn't Todd. I, was, I represented them, the embodiment of what was uh, going to just – wanted to take something from them. And, uh, and and all of that and and so I I found that to be uh, now that I look back on it it's a fascinating experience but I I wouldn't I wouldn't suggest it for anybody no absolutely absolutely not well that's it for today's episode however there's photos and videos in the show notes which are at coldwarconversations.com slash the word episode and the number sixty four. Don't forget you can support us and get a Cold War Conversations coaster at patreon.com slash coldwarpod. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash coldwarpod. If you like what you're hearing in the podcast, you can really help us as well by leaving reviews on iTunes, Stitcher, our Facebook page, or with your favorite podcast provider. This really helps raise our profile and get new guests on the show. If you can't wait for the next episode, do visit our Facebook discussion group where our guests and listeners, just like you, continue the Cold War conversation. Just search Cold War Conversations on Facebook. And we're also on Twitter at Cold War Pod and Instagram at Cold War Conversations. Thank you very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye.